been an honor just to be here with everyone, and to, especially some of the conversations I've had around the table and in the guest house. And as I prepared to come and uh, share with you all, I, I wasn't sure you know, what exactly it was that I needed to say. What was it that I contributed to the conversation? Um, I certainly could just tell you what I think everyone should be doing. <laughs> Sunday, we would find our way heading to church. And my mom tells a story of when I was about uh, probably four or five years old. I came running down the steps into the kitchen and I yelled, Preachings of the Gospel! <laughs>
found myself at Central PA in Grantham, Pennsylvania, freshman year, horrified when I got there. Thinking this might have been the worst decision I ever made in my life. Feeling out of place, feeling a little disoriented, feeling the culture shock. I was still a fairly outgoing person at that time, and so I, I adjusted, I adapted, and I, you know, I, I, I did well. I, I connected, I made friends, uh, but I was also a quiet observer of everything that was going on all around me. I slowly began to realize that the faith that I had seemed to be a little bit different than the common faith of the folks around me. Something was just different. I remember one particular chapel, and we had a guest uh, speaker by the name of John Deere who came in. Mm -hmm. And this is right after, you know, I was there from 2000 to 2004, so this is right after uh, the war, 9 11, and all that. And so John Deere is speaking directly against you know, the war, the war, the war um, and patriotism. The blindness that blind us from seeing who Jesus was. And I'm thinking, like, yeah, this is really good stuff. I mean, this is not the stuff that I was raised uh, hearing in my own church, per se, but it just rings true. And while I'm there on, like, on the edge of my seat, like, yeah, that's right. I notice all of a sudden there's this mass exodus that's taking place as hundreds of students are getting up protests, offended by this sermon and leaving. It was the most abrupt thing I had seen in my whole time at the side of college. I was trying to understand what was going on. What was it about what I had been uh, discipled and formed into that had me have a a very different kind of response to what was being said. I often say that at Messiah, I didn't become an Anabaptist, but I did get an Anabaptist seed. Uh, I was a biblical studies major, and I got to study with um, some folks that challenged me and stretched me and made me look at things a little bit differently. But I remember particularly one I was in my junior year and I uh, found myself in my student apartment struggling. <coughs> struggling with all the different ways that people justify through the scriptures every single point. Can everything be justified by scripture? Everyone had a verse. <laughs> <laughs> Being African American, because 
They loved the African students. It was the African American students that were the thugs um, that had to prove our humanity over and over again, prove that we were worthy of, of being loved and respected. The subtle comments, the microaggressions, the dream experience. Yeah, I often say it was a paper cuts, you know, like each one, it seems so minor, but by the end of it, you feel like you had a thousand paper cuts. Uh, I did, however, you know, I was uh, trying to just adapt and have fun and enjoy my college experience. Uh, I remember taking a road trip with uh, some friends. We had one friend who was from Washington State, like from the middle of nowhere in Washington State. <laughs> I didn't really believe him when he told me until we dropped him off. Until the road trip we dropped him off. <laughs> but uh, it was a fun trip. We kind of let go of the world, kind of forgot about all the problems of the world, just kind of living in our little fantasy world as we walked across the nation, right? So I'm kind of rush more and all these different places. Yeah, it was, a, it was a fun trip. And while I was there, kind of enjoying this kind of like you know, free college life, right? Towards the end of the trip, uh, before we left, um, I got a phone call. And it was my mom, and I found out that my brother had been arrested. And uh, what, what we found out uh, soon was that. He had been arrested. He was hanging out late at night with some other um, friends. And I guess a few blocks away, not right on the street, but not too far, uh, some crime was committed. And so the cops were out and they drove by. They drove by a second time. And the third time they stopped. And uh, they went to the coach with brother, arrested him because he met the description. Which was a young black male with a black t shirt and blue jeans. Trying to get high description, no complexion, no nothing else. Um, my brother spent several weeks um, in the process of not such great. Um, eventually, you know, all charges were dropped. It was clear we got him. But for me, it was significant. I mean, I knew that this stuff happened, but it was a little close to home. I mean, this was the brother, he's a year older than me. The one who people sometimes ask if we were twins. Um, and I felt a lot of a new sense of vulnerability that I had never felt before. Yeah. That, that changed me. And that changed the, I had talked about race and stuff, but it changed how I approached conversations going forward. Towards the very end um, of my graduate, my last semester, I got a phone call from Pastor Woody Dalton. I know that someone in the house knows Woody Dalton. Uh, that's a uh, member of Harrisburg Reverend Christ Church. Well, Pastor Woody called me because he wanted to come to meet me. comes to campus and um, he tells me about what, what's going on in their Christian community. He explains that they're an urban, multiracial, and a Baptist congregation there in the city of Harrisburg. Um, he tells me the story of uh, how this church was, <coughs> and it was an all-white church in an all-white neighborhood, and you know, white flight came, just like many cities. Neighborhood change. Most churches took off, but they remained. And, uh, and how they were struggling trying to become this racially reconciled community. And they talked about their mission of urban, their partnering, holistic, and all the different things that they're doing and stuff. And I was actually, and we had a great conversation. 
conversation. Um, and so a, a month after I graduated, there I was, the pastor, pastor of Brown Church. <laughs> um, and, and I didn't go because it was an Anabaptist congregation. Uh, I was wrestling with my own questions. I, I wanted to dig into this issue of grace um, in the church. I figured that we had some serious problems that we've got to work. This church was trying to make some real moves. I mean, it had empowered leaders in the church. So, two out of the five of us were African American leaders in the church. Um, and it was in the process. So, I would say this church drastically changed from when I got here to when I left. I was there for four years. Um, actually, Just really allowing those who are a part of the congregation to shape the life of the church itself. Uh, and, I, and I still remember all of that just uh, lives. Those are people that blessed me and served me uh, that I will never forget. Um, it shapes uh, how I understand who Jesus is and what it is to be a follower of Jesus. And it was in this organic, you know, Anabaptist community. I know you guys can have reputation of not being very Anabaptist, but this was an Anabaptist community. <laughs> <laughs> the past is so many times. Held to that tradition that was important to him. But uh, it was in this space uh, that it began to unconsciously shape. And at the same time, though, I wasn't necessarily trying to like become an Anabaptist. If anybody had asked me, even while I was there, if you meant Anabaptist, I said no. Um, I was reading primarily black theology, critical race studies, and racial reconciliation texts. That's what I was interested in wrestling with. So when I decided that I wanted to uh, continue my education and ended up leaving after four years and heading back to Philadelphia and went to uh, Biblical Seminary. And uh, as was mentioned, that I pursued that did with an urban concentration. Um, it was the first time that, you know, in higher education, I actually was in a classroom primarily of African Americans. It was just a, a great space for me as we wrestle with the questions that relate to our community. Uh, yeah. And yet, there was, even alongside of uh, some folks who were literally um, from sister churches, uh, who I've known from early on, in this space, I started calling myself an Anabaptist. <laughs> <laughs> I realized Formation that happened had taken place while I was there. And I wanted to acknowledge, to be honest about my journey and what had also impacted me and my faith. Uh, so I, <coughs> I wanted to pay tribute to that formation that took place, both the Messiah and in Harrisburg. I also began to run into some folks there who called themselves Neo and <laughs> our, our cohort, even though it was black, uh, we would sometimes study with other cohorts <coughs> on the main campus, which would have been mostly white suburban uh, cohorts. And so I, I found, you know, uh, who they were, what they were about, you know, uh, most women again, white middle class, highly educated males, mostly from the suburbs, uh, who I was kind of engaging in running across. Uh, and it seems, just to my interpretation, I don't know if it's just there or if this is broader, but it seems that a lot of them were coming, getting there through missional theology first, and then Stanley Howard lost. That seemed to be like the trend. <laughs> <laughs> that was the bridge to the name of baptism in our area. But um, that's a theory. It's my work in theory. But I also got invites to speak at some of these spaces and 
back to, I went to a conference this evening, back to conference. And I'll be honest, I've never felt like I fully fit in those worlds. Mm-hmm. While I was again back in Philly, studying with my black brothers and sisters, I started picking up some men in that theologians. <coughs> trying to do so from a black and a Baptist perspective. How do these two streams speak into everyday life and different issues that have come about? And I've also gotten to through that meeting all kinds of folks. Um, and I'm um, sure some of you guys have heard from mental nerves, maybe you have, maybe you have. Um, but for whatever reason, they reached out to me and wanted me to be a part of this blog collective. I agree. But I've gotten to connect with a whole variety of folks um, throughout the country, both in the Mediterranean and in the Baptist. Um, and I've gotten to meet other folks kind of like me. You know, some black folks that are in the black church. And the influence by that, actually, a lot of them a little bit different than me, that they have no interaction with the historic and the Baptist church. But they're not part of like, the neo Baptist movement either. They don't identify themselves along with those folks. Um, so um, <coughs> they just seem to kind of really resonate with a lot of what I'm doing because you know, they're trying to look for space where they belong. So for me, uh, I've been wrestling with these questions and, and trying to make sense of who I am various things that have formed me, right? I often say that my going to the PhD program is more about counseling, right? I mean, working on my own issues than <laughs> else. <laughs> but I've been able to uh, focus on black theology and anabaptism, and looking at these two machines, these two traditions that were born in the crucible of suffering. In the midst of social orders that try to literally crush them, um, they dare to reimagine who Jesus was, dare to follow him um, in the midst of being told that Jesus either is this violence, you know, persecutor, or a slave holding, endorsing, you know, slave master. Um, they dare to see otherwise. And so, in fact, 
blurs theology. Our culture blurs theology. And I kind of like I kind of went back and forth. <coughs> Do I like that phrase? Our culture blurs theology. And I went back and forth. I like it. I don't like it. I like it. I don't like it. I don't know. I like it. It's a it's an interesting four words. Sure, I overanalyze it way beyond what I should have. <laughs> but, um, but I think in thinking about it, though, and I think it does actually provide some help in um, having some conversation. It's important to acknowledge that culture and theology are always work. There are no places in which one's theology is not learned with culture. Everyone's theology bears the marks of their particular place and time in some form or fashion. Everyone's theology is situated. I think what I didn't like about the phrase was the word culture being there without any adjective before it. <laughs> That's the thing I think I didn't like about it. What culture? Whose culture? What kind of culture? Culture isn't neutral. And it's not just about difference either. Right? We think about culture primarily on the on the on the lane of difference and celebrating difference. And that's important. But it's not the only aspect of culture. And I'll give an example. So I had one of my New York Baptist friends in Philly um, inviting me to uh, uh, connect to someone to get to know me. And so um, we ended up in the middle of the afternoon uh, at this McDonald's to have some sweet tea and chat. So there we are, we're chatting, we're telling our stories a little bit, but then he like makes this move, he grabs one of the cups and puts it like right in the middle of the table. And he's like, Drew. <laughs> I can't see what's on your side. You can't see what's on my side of the cup. I need you to tell me what's on your side of the cup, and I'll tell you what's on my side of the cup. I was like, that's very nice. <laughs> Hip-hop from the 80s to the 21st century to get a job. 
right? And so there's a way in which, yes, this is thing of difference, but there's also a hierarchical way in which culture functions. And there's power related to it. It's a hegemonic reality. And that needs to be named. That has to be culture needs to be named. But it's precisely at that point that I decided I like the phrase again. Because <laughs> <laughs> it starts off with the word where culture refers to God. Yeah, I hope I realized. <laughs> <laughs> if you had to talk last night, Greg Boyd probably would not be happy because this is probably like reader response. I'm sure this is not the intent of the uh, original writers of the phrase. <laughs> but, <laughs> but where culture. Is through that route, through the question of where, of social location, of situatedness within a society that is hierarchical, and particularly as it relates to locations of power, that I think our discussion around Anabaptism can have some important significance. Now, of course, the other question is you know, so where the culture blurs the theology of Anabaptism. Well, what kind of baptism? <clears throat> There's never been a kind of baptism in theology, right? There's kind of baptisms or kind of baptist visions, or both historical and contemporary. Uh, you know, look at the historical, you know, you see Officer Hudmeyer on one hand. This magisterial understanding of what's, yeah, sure, he didn't want baby uh, baptism, but he also had this very magisterial understanding of the social order, and he didn't want that disrupted. Very different than Michael Sackler, right? Who's breaking off. Who's the, the very church is a critique against the social order. Very different understandings. Contemporary and Baptist as well. And, Multiple Anabaptists understands of what it means to be Anabaptist. It means what is Anabaptism. And what I'm trying to suggest is not that we need to have some sort of homogenous unifying perspective that everyone must agree on. But at the same time, I think we also have to be honest about what do we mean when we say Anabaptists. Not just pretend that all hands are in. Maybe all hands are not in. Right? Maybe some of our visions are conflicting. But I think we need to have an honest conversation about what do we mean when we say that about this. Uh, certainly, you know, the United Brother Christ, Church of Brethren, Ruger Hall, you know, Baptist. Within each group, and you got multiple within each group. That's just the overarching. We're a very diverse group, and diverse expressions of Anabaptism. And again, I don't think it's necessarily a problem. Uh, we must also realize that not everyone that embodies Anabaptist faith in Christ is doing so in a complementary fashion. So, what's been talked about a lot, Mr. Man, I've got some thoughts on this, you know, what's the relationship between the Mennonites and the young men of Baptists? Right? That's where we almost have that conversation. Um, I have my own thoughts. Mm -hmm. I really believe that both the neo-Anabaptist Baptist movement, we call it that, and the Mennonite church, must engage one another both critically. I, I'm not a fan of the new kids on the block or the saviors of anybody. I really don't see things that way. And I get concerned with the black men when we have that kind of conversation in which um, the neo-anabaptists are the saviors, uh, but in particular, 
continue following that because of my own experience of what I've seen. I think that there needs to be a mutual engagement and dialogue that goes back and forth. Particularly, I'll talk about my own experience of what I've seen in the United Baptist space, which doesn't quite fit quite the same as what Greg Ward was talking about in my own experience. Um, and his church may be an exception. There's always exceptions to the rule, but what I've seen is that the new Anabaptist space is a very white space. <laughs> very white space. Um, and uncritically, so. Not aware necessarily of what they're bringing to the table. So they're very conscious of men in that culture, but they're not very conscious of their own culture. <laughs> and everyone has a culture. Right. Everyone is socialized. Right. Um, and so jumping from evangelical worlds Space, they're bringing also some cultural perspectives. Right. You know, what is the baggage that they bring from evangelicalism, particularly as it relates to race? I mean, certainly, sure, there's ways we can critique the men my church, <laughs> but, but the evangelical church has some serious baggage to work through still as it relates to race and racism in the church. I don't think we can just assume that everything they bring to the table is, is just something that we should just assume and follow blindly. Mm -hmm. I think it needs to be a more dialogical, more critical engagement. Um, I've been in spaces where I mean, I've seen this past fall, some, some of you already know, this past fall, I was uh, in dialogue with some new Anabaptists who were organizing an event, um, and it was centered all around white men. <coughs> And theoretically, they invited me in to you know, give some advice on how to get a diverse group to this event. Um, and I'm like, well, let's break up the decision-making power. Let's have some uh, women and some people of color at the table. You know, that'd be a good start. And let's not center everything around white like men. They were unwilling to do so. One of the reasons I got was because these are the people that are leading the conversation. And my only response is leading your conversation. Your multiple conversations taking place. And I've been in a lot of different Anabaptist spaces. Um, and this is the only space where I've seen it only being led by white men. It's the only space. No women of color were even participating in the event at all. During us, I did a workshop there. I, I, I joked that I, I won the lot when I got to speak for black folk. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I joked while I was there because it was in September, it was literally a week prior, it was the Black Midnight Women Rock Conference. <laughs> right? And in two weeks, it was going to be the Urban and the Bad Symposium in Philly. Which was again extremely diverse, right? So we have these pockets happening in the Mennonite church where there's there is space for people of color, right? Um, and I don't think all Mennonites can take credit for the pockets that go wrong, but there's <laughs> things happening. There's some real stuff happening. Right. Um, and I don't see that happening in the other battle spaces. So I think there's things, there's ways in which they still need to Maybe slow down, maybe pay attention to some of the issues and the struggles of the Mennonite church through the 20th century. And there's some lessons that the Mennonite church has been wrestling with throughout the 20th century. There's a lot of theological reflection has been done. Um, and I don't think it's healthy for them to just see themselves as the new Mennonites or the saviors or anybody else. Not to say that they don't bring something to the conversation. They do, absolutely. But it's got to be a mutual exchange. Now, before all the announcements are had, I was at a Hope for the Future this past weekend. And I 
was invited to speak on Friday, and I was honored to just be there and hang out. Surprise some of the people that I actually knew um, that was there. But, um, My heart broke a little bit from hearing some of the stories, some of the pain and frustration of Mennonite people of color um, in the Mennonite church and the various challenges that they faced. And particularly as it relates to control over Mennonite space and institutions. Um, at the very top, Strongholds, this power and dominance that refuses to let go and share life with those who join this church. The perpetual overseers of what it means to be Mennonites. Yeah. Mennonite church has a lot of work. Yes, on one hand, even that should just 20% of the white mess and breaks. That's all of it. North America. It's much more like that. But on another hand, To the church actually shape and change and transform who we are collectively and mutually. Right. It's right. a two way relationship. Amen. 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 I think that's, that's what hasn't happened. It's, it's that in the Mennonite church, there still is a colonizing kind of way of being. Yes. Expecting everyone to assimilate. Right. One way. So we see that people of color have been willing to come in and receive, but it doesn't seem to be functioning always both ways. So that what is Mennonite should be changing constantly. We shouldn't even have to have this conversation. Fear 
turning its eyes towards the most privileged in our society as the kind of voices upon which we want to center everything around. And in doing so, turning our backs away from the most vulnerable in our society. So, meanwhile, while the Midnight Church is assimilating into our culture, black folk are catching hell. And his challenge in the 70s was that the Midnight Church could recapture and will actually refine their more faithful expression of manufacture by tapping into the black theology and the black movement that was going on that was struggling against the injustice that was going on in society. And he did believe in a mutual, yeah, he used the term, that unitive one. I don't know if you read that up, I think it's one. But, um, but, um, but different than the same, coming together, being mutually shaped by one another. But, but it's that the Midnight Church and the Anabaptist in general, those especially moving mostly in dominant culture, can, can can find a vision for Anabaptism rooted in the concrete life of oppressed and marginalized people. And that in doing so, um, can rediscover an Anabaptist witness for today that mirrors more what they, how they talk about Anabaptism in the past, right? This marginal community that that the very last was, was a critique against the social order, not an affirmation of it, right? That's what many of us, and we're not all there, there are a lot of different takes, but many folks I think that's what they want. So I think Anabaptist, but Neo Ankrado uh, needs to concretely renounce assimilation and complicity with the social order, uh, which is devastating the lives of those on the margins, um, and can do so uh, through solidarity. And I believe that it is Jesus himself who is leading, right? Who's always been that, right? Jesus who, who uh, came alongside, stood with the Samaritans and vulnerable women and the poor, right? Identified with them. And it's this Jesus that is also leading us today. He's present and calling us, bidding us to come. And it's this Jesus that is subversive, right? I mean, I always, I don't know, maybe just a little radical, but what my favorite passage, I always think about Luke 13, 31, and 35, where the Pharisees come, one Jesus that, you know, Herod wants to kill him, and he's like, go tell that fox. <laughs> 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 Healing and restoring and giving to those who are broken and hurt in life. Right? Yeah. Um, this is the Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Right. 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 right? To proclaim release of the captives, to overcome the sight of the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's day. Yes, Lord. Right. So, that's the vision for us to come around. This Jesus. Yeah. 
calling us into a new life, a reconfiguration of social relationships, a new embodiment, a struggle against the social order that, that kills, especially black and brown life. Yeah. Um, and so, anyway, we're, I'm running out of time. Let me say this. I really believe that the Mennonite Church needs to take seriously its um, power, mm -hmm. power and culture. But then also, that it would be open. Particularly, I mean, so I do my work with Black Friday and the Baptism. Uh, and you've got my latest, but in my proposal, I say, I think the Mennonite Church needs the Black Church more than the Black Church needs the Mennonite Church. I think right. Now, I do think, I think what's brought in just those two traditions, but uh, I do think that there's something there. Whatever. It doesn't mean I'm talking black, and that's the last story of this experience, but uh, there's whatever oppressed communities are in your neighbors. If you're in Canada, you're not coming alongside the indigenous populations there in Canada. Uh, Hispanic brothers and sisters in your community, you need to come alongside them. <laughs>